That, that's kind of a cue. Yeah, just okay. come on up. I'm ready for we you. We are ready. I think we all are. All right. I'm ready for you. <laughs> And that's okay, because what I want to do is this morning, we're going to do what? We're going to check your microphone. <laughs> Just go ahead and speak through the lectern for a little bit while I change the, the batteries for you. Is that it? Mm -hmm. The lectern's on now. That's, the, that's, working. that's working, okay. Okay, so we're, we're trying to find out here if, uh, if, the, energizer, if the Energizer Bunny... <laughs> he died. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the, did the Energizer Bunny leave with Easter? They have. Nice recovery. Ha ha ha. Ain't it the truth? See, I knew that about you all, but I didn't care. Wow. Okay. Okay, try it now. Uh, unless this is where I'm supposed to like testing one, two, three, or something really profound like that, right? Well, because they made it into a mono signal coming out of the wireless. <laughs> I, was, I was feeling that. There we go. I think we got it. It's there. It's there. Jim, push the lectern away from him so that you know that it's actually done. Okay. Say something. Okay. Say something pr profound. Okay. No, I can hear it myself now. We got to guess. Is that what I sound like? And you all can stand to listen to that mess? <laughs> See how they do. Okay, so this is, so are, are, we're good to go. Do I need to start over? I can do that. Go ahead. Reboot? We're in Second Kings. I know that. We're going to have last week's sushi. Are we, are we good to go now? Yes. Okay. All right, well, I, I got this whole thing waving around. So, so anyway. All right, whatever, you know, technology is great when it works. All right, so anyway, um, we're going to take some of the wisdom of the Kabbalah, and we're going we're to apply it to the Bible. But I want to tell you a secret, because it wouldn't be fun, and it wouldn't be me if I weren't going to tell you some secrets and spill the beans on you. Because the thing of it is, the thing of it is that we're going to use both. We're going to use, oh my. Okay, well, you know what? It's a sign. One way or the other, you're going to get this. One way or the other, you're going to get this. All right. 
So we decided then that the Bible's been around for some centuries, and we got that memo, but nobody really knew what to do with it. Okay? Say, now I'm going to tell you something. We're going to start right off the bat here. I'm going to tell you something that they don't tell you. All right? The secret that has been jealously guarded, zealously guarded, for, for, for centuries that they did not tell you, and here it is. There is a reservoir, a vessel, if you like, of blessings and light and healing and miracles. There is such a reservoir, but there is a lock on it. That lock is the Bible. All right? The Bible is a lock. It is very simple, and yet this very simple idea has enormous healing potential if you just think about it and meditate with it. The Bible is a lock. Now, did you ever wonder why? You know, I think about, think about things like this. You know, that's part of the problem. I think about things like this. Did you ever wonder why people shut their eyes and they imagine, I'm imagining God, I'm imagining what God looks like, right? And so I'm going to draw a picture of what I imagine. I'm coloring the lines. Or maybe I color outside the lines if that's how I imagine God is. And then, once I get my little picture drawn, I'm going to go and I'm going to get mad at those people over there because they drew a different picture. They imagined a different thing. They must be wrong. <laughs> Thank you. I was thinking the same thing. Did you ever wonder why? Did you ever wonder why? People hate one another and pass laws against one another in order to show how much they love God. Yeah. Seriously? I mean, you explain that when the aliens land. Okay? But here's the thing. Here's the thing. There is a reservoir, a vessel of light and blessings, but the Bible is a lock. And we can take that lock and gold plate it Take that lock and wrap it in velvet and parchment and linen, but it's still a lock. It's still a lock because that's what it was intended to be. But here's the exciting part. Yes, the Bible is a lock, but, oh, you're waiting for that, but Kabbalah is the key, okay? On that vessel that contains light and blessings, the Bible is a lock, but Kabbalah is the key. Now, sometimes people ask me, or kind of frequently now, they would say, well, now, what's this Kabbalah thing about? I said, well, I'm glad, I'm glad you asked that. I'm glad you asked that, and I've struggled with an answer for it, an answer that was simple and accurate and succinct, and I finally figured it out. The Bible is a lock. Kabbalah is the key. Right? Take that in. Now, what does it mean exactly what does it mean if the Bible is a lock? Now, all the times, okay, there's a big statement, all the times that the Bible was vague and boring and tedious and weird. And once you get going good, then there's a bunch of begats. And it was completely incomprehensible. That's because it was busy being a lock and keeping the light and blessings safe. That's its job. Holding on to the light and keeping hold of the blessings until we were able to open the lock. That's its job. So if you read parts of the Bible and you said, you put your know, second line, say, this is absurd. Okay? You're right. It is. And if you read part seven, you said, this is impossible. This is impossible. They did not go two by two. You're right. It is impossible. And it is absurd. And that's good. That's good. And I'm going to tell you why. But first, we step aside for a second. I want to back up just a minute. Because I, I just realized the other day, I just realized just the other day, that it's been exactly 30 years since I was introduced to science of mind. It was April of 19, mid-April mid 1988 that I was introduced to the Atlanta Church of Religious Science um, on Peachtree and 16th Street in Midtown Atlanta. And in those 30 years, I have seen a very, very great many people attracted to teachings just like this. And they were attracted to it precisely because they were tired of trying to make sense of the Bible. They're tired of it. Done with it. 
they were tired, they were tired of people who also did not understand it, beating them up with it and shoving it down their throat. Oh, I got some amens on that. I'm going to keep that in for the next time, okay? <laughs> they gave up on it. They gave up on it. But still yearned for and hungered for and wanted the light and the wisdom and the understanding and the knowledge and the love, the right direction, the balance. They still wanted that. We still want that. And, I, and, I, and that describes us. But many of us have said, the Bible makes no sense, the emperor has no clothes, and we were right. But the miracle is, this is so exciting, this is so exciting because the miracle is that this illustrates a very basic principle of Kabbalah. See, see, here it is, here it is. All spiritual light, now there's a big statement right there. All spiritual light requires a vessel in order to be a blessing. All right, take that in. This is important. All spiritual light requires a vessel in order to be a blessing. Now, spiritual, spiritual light, well, what's that? I'm glad you asked that. Spiritual light is healing. It is joy. It is prosperity. It is love, it is wisdom, it is blessings, it is all the blessings we can imagine. It is all the blessings we have yet to imagine. Now, this Kabbalistic principle, we call it light and vessel. Okay, we call it light and vessel. And this, I keep looking for a necktie. See, where's my tie? I can't see it. <laughs> this Kabbalistic principle of light and vessel is illustrated very beautifully in a metaphor shared by none other than the rabbi from Nazareth. Okay, and you know what I'm talking about. And he uses wine as a metaphor for blessings that take time. Okay? And he says, Matthew chapter 9, verse 17, he says, you don't make wine by putting grape juice into an old, worn-out bottle. Okay? You don't do it. Because the juice ferments, the bottle explodes, you got no wine, and you got no bottle. Won't work. He says, no, you put the grape juice into a new bottle, a new vessel, Okay, that will hold the juice until it becomes wine. Okay? Now, you have to have a vessel for spiritual light to become a blessing. Okay? Bookmark that. That's important. Now, to change our minds and change the world, we have to have a vessel in order to reveal the blessing. That's the rule. Now, the absurdity, the nonsense that we find beginning on page one of the Bible and continuing to page number last, that's part of the vessel. That's part of the vessel that hides the light of healing and blessing. Now, the beauty of this, one of the great things that I learned when I came to Science of Mind 30 years ago, it's not our job to convince God to answer our prayer. Oh my goodness, that was, one of the, that was big for me. It's not our job to make the light work. What a relief, <laughs> above my pay grade. But our job is to create a vessel. Our job is to create a vessel and keep that vessel clean so we can receive blessings, all right? Formula, here's your formula. Make a vessel, receive blessings, share same, rinse and repeat. <laughs> all right? Make a vessel, receive blessings, Share same, rinse and repeat. Now, sounds great, but how do we do that? All right? It is explained in the fourth chapter of the second book of Kings. And it's a real sweet story. It's a story of Elisha. Elisha Navi, Elisha the prophet. And here's the story, chapter four. There was a woman whose husband died. And he owed money. And when the widow could not pay, the creditors came to take her sons to sell them as, as slaves in order to cover the debt. And the woman didn't know what to do. So she called out to Elisha the prophet. Chapter, chapter 4, verse 2, Elisha said unto her, oh, he said unto her, you know, what shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, 
Thine handmaid hath nothing in the house except a pot of oil. Then Elisha said, Go. You like that? Go. Borrow for yourself vessels from all thy neighbors everywhere. Empty vessels and borrow a lot. Not a few, but a lot. All right? And when thou art come inside, and thou shalt shut the door. Now, doesn't that sound like, once again, the rabbi from Nazareth? He says, when you pray, don't make a big show out on the street. Go in your, in your, your closet and shut the door. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about, I mean, we've been shutting doors for centuries. But it's, it's talking about making a vessel. He's talking about making a vessel to receive the energy. Okay, so where are we? Okay. Shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour oil into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went and shut the door upon herself and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured the oil in, glug, 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 you know. <laughs> and it came to pass, when all the vessels were full, glug, 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 she said to her son, quick, bring me another vessel. He said, mom, there are no more vessels. We fill them all, glug, glug. And the oil stopped. The oil stopped. And so she came and she told Elisha. And Elisha said, go. You like that? You know it's the Bible now. Go, sell the oil, pay the debt, and you and your sons can live comfortably on the rest. Isn't it a sweet story? Okay, 2 Kings chapter 4. It's a sweet story. It is full of meaning and light. But we're going to concentrate on what it means to create a vessel. Because that's our job. So we're going to change our minds and we're going to change the world one miracle at a time. But, but, what does it mean to change your mind? Well, change your mind, change your life. You ever heard that? Oh my goodness. It's been pounded into us like a mantra. Well, change your, change your mind, change your life. Oh, couldn't you change your mind? Well, change your mind, change your life. You know, and it's this guilt thing. It's this, this new thought, new age guilt thing. Well, I see you didn't change your mind. It's a great slogan, and that's what it's become. So the question should be, how do I change my mind? All right? And, and the changing of mind that we're really familiar with is like this. It goes like this. Well, I was going to have lunch at Applebee's, but I changed my mind and decided to go out back instead. I changed my mind. <laughs> or I was going to wear a necktie, but I decided I wear a bow tie instead. I changed my mind. And it's true. It's true. I did change my mind. But when we try to apply that level of thinking into our spiritual life and our prayer life, it doesn't work very well. It doesn't connect. So what I want us to do is we're going to forget. We're going to forget. Change your mind. Forget it. Forget it. It ain't worked yet. We're not going to change our minds. We are going to do something different. We're going to take it to a different level. We are going to exchange our minds. We're going to get one that works. You know? <laughs> We're going to change our minds, and so I want to share with you a very exciting technique that will change your thinking, exchange your mind, and open your life to miracles. Are you on board with me? Yes. All right. It takes a little effort. That's the bad news. But it's not hard. So we're going to create a vessel. Here's how you do it. Start with desire. The ultimate no-brainer, everybody starts with desire. Okay, the problem is that most of the time we don't go past that. And that's the least part of it. Okay? The, but you know what? The, the beauty of it, the beauty, we don't have to get rid of desire. Okay? We don't have, in this tea, we do not have to get rid of, of desire. And that's good news. We, uh, instead of trying to get rid of desire, well, you know, I meditated for years and I really wanted to get rid of desire. But I couldn't. I couldn't do it. So instead of trying to get rid of the desire, we're going to do something radical and we're going to take that desire and we're going to use it as a tool in our tool belt. Nothing more than a tool in the tool belt. 
a tool for spiritual awakening and miracles. So let's get our mindset. Take this in. We're going to do a series of affirmations. Take this in. I want a miracle. I want, thank you. I want a wonder. I want healing. I hear you. I want love. Are you there with me? You got it? Okay. Your first level of vessel is desire. But that ain't enough. So we're going to take it to a new level. This is revolutionary and it's exciting because it's real. Not just pretty words. Not just, well, it's a beautiful idea. Oh, yeah, we'll make a picture of it and, and celebrate it or something. Affirm this with me. I am not my thoughts. I am not my thoughts. <sighs> Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> this idea alone, this idea alone will change your life. So, well, if I'm not my thoughts, then who am I? I'm glad you asked that question. All right, I am not my thoughts. Likewise, I am not my feelings. Who am I? I am, I am the one who uses thought and feeling to express myself. My thoughts and feelings do not use me. They are the clothing of my consciousness. Thoughts and feelings have no power over me. Say that with me. Thoughts and feelings have no power over me. Yeah, say you're getting it. Thoughts and feelings have no more power over me than a bow tie and a sport coat. And they don't get a choice. I have power over thoughts and feelings because I am the one who thinks and feels. <sighs> Did you get that memo? That is exchanging your mind. Now, I want you to, we're going to say it out loud. I want you to dare to believe. It's a safe place, a sacred space. Dare to believe. And we're going to affirm with this. I have power over my thoughts and feelings because I am the one who thinks and feels. Say that with me. I have power over my thoughts and feelings because I am the one who thinks and feels. Yeah. My thoughts and feelings have no power over me. I have power over them. Because my thoughts and feelings are the tools in my tool belt, the clothing of my consciousness, and they have no more power over me than a hammer and a nail. They're tools. I am the one who thinks and feels. Now, let me tell you something. This is the self that Yogananda talked about. This is the big S self that Course in Miracles talks about because this is the hem of the robe of Christ. It's real, not just pretty words, it's real. I am that self that thinks and feels and I communicate through this body. All right? This is exciting. Now let's review. There is a reservoir of blessings and light, but the Bible is a lock that locks up the light and the blessings and the miracles. Spiritual light requires a vessel in order to be a blessing. Kabbalah is the key. This is some heavy duty stuff, people. Kabbalah is the key that was given to us to unlock the lock and get the miracles and blessings. And realizing that we are the consciousness that uses thought and feeling. That's what's meant by the phrase change your mind, but we're tired of changing our minds. We're going to exchange our minds for something wholly new. Now, let's change our lives. Let's change the world one miracle at a time. And I want to teach you a very simple, but very, very powerful thing. It's simple, but it's not effortless. This is a teaching that comes directly from the Zohar, the big book of Kabbalah, Torah-based Kabbalah. The Zohar is a long series of Kabbalistic teachings on the Bible. It was compiled in the early 2nd century and then hidden in the ruins of the temple in Jerusalem where it stayed hidden for a thousand years. And in the Zohar, Rabbi Shimon, 
just Simon the teacher, Rabbi Shimon, teaches us about the miracle of night study or study after midnight. This is the teaching that I want to give you. When we desire a blessing or a healing or we need a miracle, well, we need a vessel. Here's how to create a vessel. It's simple, but it requires some effort and a sacrifice. <coughs> you want to go there? Yes. Is that a yes? All right. This is a form of prayer and fasting taught to us by Rebbe Shimon. So we're going to start with the Kabbalistic meaning of Psalm 119, verse 62. And King David says, At midnight I will rise to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgment. This is the secret of night study or study after midnight. It's very simple. Here's how it works. Rise from bed after midnight. All right. Set the alarm. Do whatever it is you need to do to make this work. You rise after midnight to read or study spiritual material. Now, in fact, one of my mentors at the Kabbalah Center used to suggest lighting a candle. Sometimes, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Read or study your spiritual, midnight, your spiritual material for at least half an hour. Blow out the candle and you're done until the next night. Very powerful thing. Well, how long do you have to keep this up? Glad you asked that. As long as you need to, okay? As long as you're moved to do it. So, it's a simple technique, but what kind of spiritual material are we supposed to read or study? Well, let me tell you something. The best choice, the best choice for this technique is something challenging. Don't make it easy. Okay? Something challenging, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a suggestion that the books of Leviticus and Numbers are excellent choices. Here's why. All right, struck a nerve there. Good, good, good. All the books of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they're already vessels of light. Already. Just sitting there on the table, they're already vessels of light and blessing. So, if the objective is to create a vessel, then connecting to those books that are already vessels will provide us with a pre-assembled, already made, no assembly required vessel. And, oh my, there is truly, there's truly, truly an amazing amount of light locked inside the books of Leviticus and Numbers. That's why they're so hard and tedious. The Bible's a lock, Kabbalah's the key. Now, here's why it works. There, here's what actually happens when you rise after midnight and study a spiritual text. All right, question and answer time. What blocks us from miracles and blessings? Thoughts, mind, ego. All right. What does ego like to do? Distract, take charge. Yes, and while it's distracting and taking charge, it likes to sleep. Ego likes to be comfortable. Ego, ego has, likes my comfort zone. This is my comfort zone. You can't make me get out of my comfort zone. Ego is in your comfort zone. You got a comfort zone, you got ego. I want to be comfortable. I want to sleep. Oh, we'll do it tomorrow. I'm really comfortable now and I worked hard. Okay? So here's the thing. If I rise after midnight, I have automatically scored a victory against my ego. I have already removed, I have automatically removed a curtain that blocks my blessing. Yeah. I have asserted the authority of my Christ consciousness over my ego. The Christ consciousness that uses thought and feeling, I have asserted that over my ego. Okay. Now, why choose a challenging text? What does ego like? Ego likes it to be easy. Easy. Make it easy. Don't challenge me. Don't take me out of my comfort zone. It's my comfort zone after all, and it's all about me. So don't let it be easy. Choose a challenging text. Choose to, some, to, choose to study something that really is challenging and you automatically reduce the amount of ego in your life. Now, here's the formula. You want a formula? 
You digging it? Yeah. Ego brings chaos. Rule of thumb, ego brings chaos. Reduce ego, reduce chaos. <sighs> Rising from midnight is also a form of fasting. What is fasting? Fasting is a technique for reducing ego by withholding something that ego really, really wants. Usually food. But it can also be sleep. We also can fast from sleep because ego consciousness likes to sleep and stay asleep. Okay. Now, the logical question, what is ego? It is that part of us that is asleep and wants to stay asleep and not be bothered. Okay. All the time is trying to take charge and run the show. It really wants to sleep and be comfortable. And waking and rising after midnight to study a challenging spiritual material connects us to that spiritual dimension of light and healing and blessings. All right? Take this in. Waking and fasting from sleep for half an hour every night will reduce ego. It will assert the power of the light in our lives. It will create a vessel through which miracles and healing can be made manifest. Okay? This is heavy duty. Exchange your mind and change your life. Okay? But wait, there's more. But you knew that. There's actually a much more interesting reason to study the books of the Torah in your night study. And here's the real reason, uh, as explained in the Zohar. Now, when people pray, okay, people pray, everybody prays. What are they trying to do? One thing, they don't know it, but what they're trying to do is create a vessel. They're trying to create a vessel through which the blessings and miracles be made manifest because the light requires a vessel to be a blessing. But the problem is, for most people, it's very haphazard. Okay, it's very disorganized. And so prayer very famously becomes a hit and miss sort of a thing. But we know how to exchange our minds to create a vessel by starting with desire and we take it to the next level with night study and fasting from sleep. Now, using the Torah for your night study takes your practice to a still higher level of power. And here's why. This is, I was so excited when I read this, I just couldn't wait to share it with you. The words of the Torah are templates. Okay, they didn't tell us this in Sunday school. The words of the Torah are templates for the Creator's light. Do you remember? All right, decades ago. Four or five or something, I don't know. But anyway, you remember that toy? I didn't have one, but the kids next door did. And, and you, you take Play-Doh, right? You take Play-Doh, and you put the Play-Doh in a hopper, and, and you have this thing, and it pushes the Play-Doh through these templates, and you, and the, you move the templates around, you get, you get strings or ribbons or... or or stars, yeah, see, you had, you, we all played with those. Let's see how we turned out. 